Um, well, let me uh, pick up on how did you convince arguably the most important newspaper in the world to let you be a fly on a wall? Well, um, <clears throat> when I began to uh, think about making this film, um, it was a very unique moment, which in many ways persists with its sort of core challenges to the newspaper industry, but in terms of its sort of general tension has somewhat subsided. So this is basically the beginning of 2009, um, and there was a, a sort of a sense among the, the New York sort of digerati and intelligentsia that print media as we know it was completely uh, sort of going to be transformed and, and good riddance to them. Uh, um, there, there was a sort of dancing on the grave sentiment um, to a lot of people's speculations about what could happen to the New York Times. <clears throat> I found this to be a very curious position for people to take who, who um, arguably are, are really kept not only informed but also enlightened by the Times and by print, you know, a lot of traditional uh, media outlets. And so I approached David Carr, who was somebody who had been in my last film and who I knew, and said, what about telling a story over your shoulder about the implosion of media? Um, and really focusing on the media desk as a sort of play within a play, um, which would be a prism for people to, first of all, understand how the media landscape is transforming, but also to see the journalism that takes place at an institution like the Times. And so I think it was this, this general sort of conceit of having a play within a play and being able to just observe in, 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 a, in an objective format what the journalism is like at the Times that persuaded Bill Keller to authorize the project. Did you have a meeting with Bill Keller? Did you present this to him? And That's did right. Did he make his decision quickly? He, he's, you know, I, I went through six months of meetings with various people at the Times, um, including all the members of the media desk, uh, many of whom expressed a lot of concerns. But the, the last meeting was with Bill. And um, what he said is, you know, I'm proud of my writers and I would like the world to see them. And again, I think it was this notion of the world being able to see what's happening, to give people a front row seat um, in the sort of tradition and, and with the aspirations of, of cinema verite and observational documentary, rather than a, a more polemical structure that would be trying to sort of prosecute a thesis about what is the future of journalism, something which, you know, for all the experts we spoke to, no one really had a sort of taught answer to, to what is the future. So in a sense, you were embedded in the New York Times the way the NBC reporter was embedded to cover the end of the Iraq war. Well, you know, the, um, the NBC reporters, I believe, had to pay to be, to be present in Iraq um, for, for, that, uh, for that story. And, you know, the word embed is, is one that I think kind of communicates a certain amount of um, potential for brainwashing, shall we say? <laughs> but this is um, a, but this is this is a pitfall, though I think sometimes with documentary filmmakers <coughs> that you do get seduced by the subject matter. David Carr is an irresistible character, and ultimately your movie is a very positive movie about the New York Times. Were you a po did you have a positive take on this newspaper when you went in, or did you just fall in love with these guys and the characters and the crusade that they're on? Well, I think. Trying to tell a story about what's happening to newspapers in print and doing it from the perspective of writers at the Times already is going to sort of, you know, slant your hand a little bit. So, so that I completely acknowledge as being um, a, a, a framing device that has a little bit of a, of a conclusion, you know, built for it. But you have to remember that when I started shooting, it was two weeks before the layoffs took place, these historic 10% um, um, reduction in the newsroom and you know there was a sense that you know no one really knew what would happen to the times um, so I, I definitely didn't sort of go in there thinking that this was going to be a happy story or one that was you know necessarily going to be positive I mean it could have been that I found an institution that was totally sort of archaic and and and, and wasteful and and kind of looked foolish I mean honestly I did not know what I would find I'm someone who um, has read the Times um, 
pretty much all my life. And, and my co-producer, Kate Novak, and I have a high esteem for the paper. But it's something that, like many viewers, exists in a sort of physical form. Um, you read people's bylines and you see these stories. And we didn't know what it would be like to go inside there. So, you know, what you see is, is, a, is a very it's what you unfiltered, discovered. yeah, I mean, and, and, if, and if people respond positively to that and find David to be a sort of heroic figure, that's not for, you know, for want of trying I to I was do just it. surprised given the state of the times in this movie, which seems <coughs> doom and gloom, that Bill Keller's still riding around in the black town car. You think, you think he might take a subway and they could cut the expenses that way? You know, he was actually going to, um, a, an event at Columbia Journalism School that Emily Bell was um, moderating about uh, WikiLeaks, and Alan Rusbridger was there. So I think probably Columbia. Sent the car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Andrew, you spend a lot of time with these guys who think about this every day. What are they concluding, and what do you conclude about the future of the physical paper? Well, specifically about the physical paper, I do think my, my instinct is, and I, and I think probably David shares this, is that it will perhaps exist as a fetish object, as a sort of luxury item like vinyl does today. Um, and the time specifically as being perhaps one of those type of objects that people may be even more attracted to could exist in that form, but within 20, 25, 30 years, I, I, I really do think that people will be, you know, so attached to their smartphones and, and, and other objects like that that they'll be getting their information through that format, but it, you know, I know that the sort of platform agnosticism sort of line is a cliche by this point, but in a way, it, you know, cliches are, are, are so for a reason, it doesn't necessarily matter what the format is and if you're reading it and getting your hands, you know, dirty with print, as long as the journalism survives. Right, it was something that came through in the movie a bit, articulated by people outside the Times, although once or twice by, by David, that I wanted to touch on. One of the things that's interesting, I think, in the history of the New York Times right now is it's not only, I think, that they've been grappling with the economic collapse of their business, but I think the Times for years, because it was the most important paper in the world, it was the gatekeeper of information, it had no competition. And that, I think, as David said, breeds some, fosters some arrogance there. Now, what the Times will never get back is, I can go online and I can look at The Guardian. I can look at The Telegraph. I can look at The Financial Times with a click. The Times, do you think, guys, will ever have that monopoly of power over information that it had for so long? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, when my book came out, I talked to a producer uh, from CBS uh, from Sunday morning and um, asked her what she thought if The New York Times because my book starts uh, with Abe Rosenthal's nightmare that he wakes up Wednesday morning on a Wednesday morning and there's no New York Times. And I've said, what do you think the implications would be for CBS? And she said, because I said, it seems like the broadcast networks are less reliant on the front page of the New York Times than they had been in the past. And her response was, if the Times um, stops publishing, that night's news broadcast will be five minutes long. So they still, at they least have, at a, at a producer have. level, they rely on it tremendously. Yeah. Um, I think, though, regionally, you know, there were a lot of papers that didn't have, didn't look at the Times as, a, as a, the Times did not have a monopoly. There used to be an LA Times that was a great national newspaper and actually had one of the best international news sections. It had foreign bureaus yeah. in almost the same cities that the Times had. The Chicago Tribune used to have great foreign bureaus under, right. under, right. under McCormick. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the Chicago Tribune because I had a, a conversation on radio on uh, <laughs> uh, a very well-known uh, uh, radio host from Chicago had me on with James Warren, who's the fo former editor of the Chicago Tribune. And we both agreed that part of the problem with the news business is that the gene for public affairs has simply not been passed from one generation to, to the current generation. And Jim Warren, along with a lawyer, a labor lawyer in Chicago a couple of years ago, wrote a wonderful piece, and I recommend it to everybody. It's, you can Google it. It's called Why Johnny Couldn't Bother. And it's essentially, he, he wrote it, the peg was the American Society of Newspaper Editors Conference 
in April of every year, and they, all, they bend themselves into pretzels wondering why young people don't re read the news. Well, part of the problem is that young people are brought up in a public school system that doesn't teach civics, doesn't teach history, doesn't teach geography the way it should, and that sim and they just don't get that public affairs gene. And there's not much the news industry can do about that unless they start identifying it as a problem and putting pressure or writing to it or getting up at the National Association of Social Studies teachers and saying, you guys aren't doing your job. Get, get our paper in your classroom. Get more than the Scholastic Update or Scholastic whatever it's called now. You know what I found interesting in the movie? We, we keep hearing young people don't read newspapers and not par paying attention to the, the New York Times anymore. And yet, most of these guys who are putting the newspaper together are fairly young people. I mean, they're, you know, they're in their 30s and, and, and in their 40s. Who are they putting this paper together for then? Well, I do think that the demographic skews um, sort of older, mm -hmm. probably, you know, the majority of, of readers of the paper are in their 50s, maybe, or mm -hmm. over 45. But, um, you know, I think to your point about sort of competition and being able to read The Guardian and sort of have this, this this glorious like feast buffet of, of options that are available to you online, you know, I think that that's also stimulating the sort of competitive instincts of, of institutions like the Times. And you know, for, for my money, being able to read um, the WikiLeaks stories and, and see those as sort of blockbuster packages on, on the front page of the paper for you know, 10 days in a row um, is something that would make me want to stay engaged with that with that outlet with that product. Same, the same goes for a story that you know leads to the to the resignation of a CEO, as as we see with the Tribune Company story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or the governor Elliot Spitzer, which the that's Times exactly wrote right. That story. Or, or Michael Barbaro's um, reporting on on TikTok of how gay marriage occurred and and his coverage of, of the Bloomberg administration. You know, so and 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 having somebody like. Um, Tim Marengo be the, the Baghdad bureau chief and keeping you know um, boots on the ground reporting in in a zone like that. So whether it's local or cultural or business stories or or, or, or foreign affairs, international, you know it, it's about breaking stories like that. Not always necessarily breaking news that you know uh, from second to second, but sometimes it's investigative pieces like the one that David did here that you know take months of, of research but have a huge impact. Uh, my final question for you, because I think this is something that is grappled with in the movie, especially with WikiLeaks. There is this tension of, with the internet, vast amounts of information can just be put out there. And you're left to yourself to sort it out. The people who run the Times, I think, they believe that it is better to have gatekeepers themselves who get that information, who sort it out for you and decide what will go into the paper, what you will receive. Do you think that's better for journalism? Well, I certainly, I don't think gates are good in, in almost any context, especially when it comes to information, unless you know, national security is an issue. And, and certainly, it can be argued that that is at stake with a lot of the, the WikiLeaks material. And I think that the Times and the Guardian Der Spiegel, at least in the tranche of Afghan and Iraq war logs, um, and then later El Pais and Le Monde, which were part of the state secrets, you know, did a lot of work to redact names, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's crucial. But to me, I read the, sort of the the WikiLeaks story in a different way than terrorism, and more as as an example of a sort of uh, it, within the structure of a play within a play about what's happening to the media. It's 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 a fantastic three act play in which in the first act, you know, Bruce, we see him there, sort of saying it's this. You know, the, the Baghdad video has been released straight to YouTube, mm -hmm. and it's this existential crisis among the journalists. Why didn't they go through us? Why didn't they go through NBC or the New York Times, as they did with the Pentagon Papers? But ultimately, when the release was uh, database and word-based rather than moving images, it, it actually required the skill set of traditional journalism sifting through you know, reams and reams of data and creating, structuring stories that identify themes and give meaning to that, to that data and putting together packages with photographs and timelines and, 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 and a multimedia presentation that, you know, WikiLeaks and Julian with all of his, his, his many sort of far-flung resources in terms of servers and, and, and sources 
could not muster. And so in a way, it's actually a total vindication of this very sort of um, old school kind of activity that, that, that journalists do. Well, you were perceptive and, and very honest enough to, to show that part where they said, well, he released two different versions. That was excellent. Yeah, I thought. You and actually saw, the, you saw you the professionals know, at work, but yeah. they said, well, this is the edited one, and here's the edited one that show people and, the guns. And Bill Keller says, well, I hope these facts kind of touch somewhere close in the story. And to the Times' credit, they, they, they wrote about that in the, in the same story. And that was a very, very sharp and, and, and I think smart thing to have in the film. Thank you.